Kennard, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm online, Bill. I'm ready to go. I need screen take sharing it. privilege. Take it away. All right, so 10.40 exactly. So, okay, all right. So this is the presentation from the HPC and data center Twig. Uh, Dell Baker and I uh, call it it. Uh, you have our control uh, contact information here, but in case you don't, you can send me a uh, chat message and it'll get you connected. So this Twig focuses on uh, the system in a package realizations of solutions for the HPC and data center market as well as high-end networking. So you look at uh, uh, systems that integrate accelerators, uh, storage, general purpose processing element and IO, et cetera, et cetera, for uh, these markets. We focus specifically on performance issues, power management issues, security, power distribution, conversion, and other issues that affect uh, SIPs in this uh, market segment. And everything is being driven today by a number of uh, C changes that hap are happening in the world of applications, uh, analytics slash intelligence on demand, big data processing, IOTs and age, and blockchain processing, which can be used for things other than Bitcoin, you know, and transaction processing. So emerging uh, processing and uh, substrates, accelerator and memory technologies, quantum computing, are driving new system architectures. So the reason for uh, the need to have heterogeneous integration in this market segment is pretty clear. We have looked at this earlier. The uh, chiplet or die cost per unitary is increasing more than linearly. That's a problem. So you can't really solve the problem by building a big chip. We have to limit the chip sizes and uh, put a lot of them together as a system in a package. And the true uh, problem is that it's, you know, at the end of the day, it all boils down to moving data from point A to point B within the, uh, within the package and also going outside the package. And suddenly we need storage to be very close to the processing artifact within the package. So these are the architecture drivers and the immediate need uh, that have to be, you know, addressed to do these things efficiently uh, in an energy efficient way to be more specific. And uh, uh, general purpose computing chiplets are obviously not the panacea for solving anything and everything in an any energy efficient manner. And special purpose accelerators are pretty much needed here. And this is the key to addressing the dark silicon problem that you see with general purpose uh, substrates. So how does heterogeneous uh, integ integration help in this market segment. It certainly allows you to uh, avoid the need for a single large die and realize everything in a cost-effective manner and products that can be quickly fronted to the market. It allows you to tightly couple critical components such as processor, accelerators, memory, and high-speed IO with very short reach interconnections within the package. It exploits the full uh, uh, palette of uh, chiplets that you have to solve these problems. And because of the integration, you limit the off-chip traffic and ease uh, the IO needs for the package a little bit, okay? So the goal is of obviously, you want to realize a sieve where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So what I'm going to do is to focus on the updates we have in a chapter rather than on focusing on everything and, uh, we have covered. So for the, our coverage, to get an idea of that, you can look at our 2019 chapter, which is online, and the 22, uh, 2020 chapter will be coming online very, very soon. So uh, the green uh, lines in everything that follows point to the up, uh, updates we have in the 2020 chapter. We are looking at new accelerators, uh, including um, data processing accelerators that do memory in memory style processing or processing close to memory. We are looking at analog solutions for implementing machine learning. We are looking at encryption decryption engine and a bunch of other things, okay? 
uh, one of the key requirements is that you have to accommodate possibly analog chiplets along with digital chiplets. So power distribution concerns are there, uh, noise, power quality, et cetera. So we are also looking at IO support chiplets. Uh, aside from the traditional electrical, some things have happened in the uh, real world in the last year. Integrated photonics have, has come a long way. And we are also looking at data compression and decompression in line to further improve the IO connectivity. And one of the big things we have added in our chapter would be quantum computing platforms. And given the heavy physics oriented explanation of everything and anything, we try to write this as a survey section. It's about seven, eight pages. And that was truly intentional to let people understand what this is about in a way that engineers can understand. So interconnections, the emphasis would be for uh, solutions that allow you to stack things vertically. Uh, technologies such as face-to-face -face bonding, you know, use of Damascene solutions to implement bumpless connections and reduce the connection reach and avoid the RC problems, et cetera. We also added an extended section on chiplets, looking at the emerging chiplet interconnection standards, and I've listed some of them. Uh, we also uh, have to address the uh, power distribution and thermal challenges in the stack solutions. So that's a call to the thermal group. And we also want to look at what it takes to cool photonics. Okay, so let's quickly move on. Power distribution would look at, you know, a few things that I will discuss during the uh, intergroup meeting. Quantum computing, as I said, is a big thing. We have to look at solutions that require intense cooling which is the vast majority of the solutions. You have to cool things down, at least parts of the system down to 20 uh, uh, milli uh, degrees Kelvin. And then there are, there are of course solutions that don't require that aggressive scaling, including some that claim to operate at room temperature. Uh, one of the things that affect the accuracy and the reliability of quantum uh, computing platform would be something called decoherence where the state stored in a quantum uh, a binary bit, also called a qubit, Deteriorate. One, one minute, can I add? Yes, yes, I'm there. Good. So we are looking at system level architecture. We address all these challenges and point out the challenges, okay, and how they're being addressed. So there are the these are the company and chapters uh, in the tweak that we uh, intend to heavily interact with. That said, we'll also need to interact with a few other uh, tweak chapters that are not mentioned here. And that's part of the workshop engagement we have. And that's uh, all I have, Bill. And thanks for your attention. Perfect. So let me start. The, this is a list of the contributors. I wanted to acknowledge quite a few of them who gave me very, very coherent feedback. If we go to the next slide, Rachel. Okay, so the chapter objectives have not changed. We said we would proliferate a standard Nomen standardized nomenclature. Uh, this has been continued. We haven't made any changes. We said we would look at all possible metrics and proliferate the right ones. Uh, the chapter still has the same construction. We have the converged nomenclature. We have the key metrics. We talk about difficult challenges and discussion. If you go to the next slide, Rachel. So this is the converged framework. Nothing has changed, but I wanted to bring it up to make one specific comment. This is a nomenclature slide. There is no intent to describe equivalence between each of the architectures described here it has its own pros and cons. There is no comparison between arch architectures. It is just a statement. Here are all the architectures and how they should be categorized. Uh, because there was a discussion at the Interpac workshop that this somehow implies equivalence. I want to make sure there is no, uh, you know, nothing says one is equal to the other. Okay. Uh, next slide. These are examples of how the nomenclature can be implemented or you know, used to describe different uh, 2D, 2 and half D, 3D architectures. And the intent here is to show that the nomenclature is complete and we haven't found any case where uh, we cannot describe it in the nomenclature we, uh, in the nomenclature we offer. Okay. Next slide. So one of the things we did was we talked about the physical metrics and 
when we had written this chapter the last time around, we had metrics that uh, we had published, we as in Intel had published. Since that point, TSMC has come up with their own set of metrics. So for completeness, we have put both of them. You will notice that there is really no difference. We used to describe IO per millimeter of dye edge per layer and IO per millimeter square. What TSMC did was take the same two numbers and multiply them together. So we still have a complete set of metrics, but I want to make sure that everyone's aware we have included the TSMC feedback. We directly approached TSMC, and I'd like to acknowledge Jan Waldeman's help in doing this. Uh, and this slide that you see on the right is input TSMC gave us. Next slide. Uh, Rachel, did we skip a slide in between? There was one that showed the changes. Uh, if you don't mind flipping. Uh, no, if you go back one, one more. One more. Okay, this one, yeah. So uh, I want to point out what have we, what we promised and what we've delivered. We said we would cross-reference with other chapters. We have cross-reference with other chapters. We said we would make the wirebond section more comprehensive. Jan helped us get in touch with the wirebond folks. So we have made changes that com complete the wirebond. Uh, we said we would summarize and classify every known instantiation of 2D and 3D architectures, including wafer scale. We have done that through references. Uh, we said all technology announcements since this roadmap was published uh, should, be an, uh, should be listed. So we have now significantly enhanced the reference list if you look at it. Uh, you know, things like Cerebrus and the silicon interconnect fabric are now fully referenced. So people can take a look at them. Uh, we said we would add new metrics. We have done that. Uh, Gemal pointed out very importantly that the impact of warpage must be comprehended, though it's not directly the chapter content. I think it's a very important comment. So we put a note to that effect. Uh, and then we updated the socket trends graph. Uh, we got feedback from three peer reviews uh, and we included uh, we responded to all of them except one in which, uh, you know, which asked for really a complete redraw. And I said, we'll do it in the 2021 chapter. Okay. Uh, so if we move forward, uh, I, I'll be done in a minute or so. Uh, one more, uh, Rich. Okay. So the nomenclature, interconnect nomenclature hasn't changed. We still talk about die to die on package, die, uh, die to die interconnects, die to package interconnects within package, which is not covered here, covered in the substrates chapter. We talk about the package to board interconnects and the package on package interconnects. Uh, okay. If you go to the next slide, the tables haven't changed all that much. Okay, we did clarify a few things in the tables based on uh, peer review feedback, but the tables themselves have not changed. And one of the questions we would like to answer this year is, is this a conservative roadmap, an aggressive roadmap, or is it a just right roadmap? Uh, so I plan to initiate discussions much earlier and make sure that we stay in tune with the way, pace of the industry. Uh, and, you know, we've defined our generations very carefully in this chapter. The difficult challenges haven't changed. They are still the same signal integrity impact, novel assembly for solder and non-solder, fine pitch sort and test, which throughout the year we have seen many people talk about we even went to this too hot to test meptech seminar last uh, week or week before last and they had the same conversation there uh, we've kept in design and process code design as a important note and equipment readiness so in chapter 20 uh, in the 2021 chapter, these are possible plans because I haven't run it by the working group yet. Uh, what I'd like to do is across the board, improve the images in the chapter, uh, make sure that cross-referencing still continues with other chapters. As I said, recalibrate on the projections, projections and if possible, think through a complete rewrite. Content won't change, but the style of writing may change. Uh, and I'm open to any other suggestion You know, we uh, made. And the updated chapter has been released. We got feedback uh, from everyone. We changed it. Uh, and I think it is, in my opinion, satisfactory response to all reviewer feedback. Uh, many people contributed to the content. I'd like to thank everyone, both for the peer reviews as well as the uh, feedback uh, from different twigs. Uh, we always welcome new participants. So please contact me if you need more. And the chapter should be up on the website. The work has been done and Paul had it. And I think Paul's probably ready to post it if he hasn't already posted it. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Now turn it over. Is Asmat or Madhu going to talk for uh, Thermal? Yeah, I, will. I can talk. Okay, great. Thank you for having us. Uh, I represent the Thermal Technical Working Group along with Asmat Malik and uh, Wehua Tang. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, what we've been up to and where we think we're going. So the goals of the thermal technical working group has not changed. And we're still looking at the die level, package integration, and system level limited to the board level, meaning we're not looking at a rack of servers or a data center, server hall, or chiller plants. So we have limited our scope uh, to A, B, and C listed here. Uh, that was done more than two years ago, and we're, we're holding to that. We have focused on articulating of uh, canonical problems. Part of the reason we chose, <coughs> chose to do that was thermal is a cross-cutting uh, twig, and it's hard to boil the ocean, so it's really helpful to surface uh, canonical challenges, and then look, uh, try to go a little deeper into each of those canonical challenges. So that, that's how we, we've been operating. In parallel to the canonical challenges, what we do is we do do a sweep across the board of uh, cooling technologies and advanced concepts and look to surface them. They don't always match up one-to-one -one in terms of time scales or uh, meeting all the requirements. Uh, but that's been our approach thus far. And we are, we are open to any feedback uh, from the broader community. Uh, year one was uh, 2018 to 2019. And you can see what we did there. Uh, that chapter is published. Um, year two is uh, 2019 to 2020. We're still pending our submission for our 2020 chapter. And that should happen pretty sh uh, shortly. What we've included is uh, power density, and uh, content around HPMs. And for year three, similar to what uh, Ravi mentioned, I think we, we need to see, do we want to rewrite it, rewrite the content? Do we want to keep adding to the content? Uh, uh, what, do, what do we want to do going forward? And uh, you know, that's an opportunity to expand on a lot of technical uh, content. And we have a lot, we've grown to be, to be a quite a lot of contributors. Uh, this is a pretty big list of contributors, so obviously I won't go through all of them, but uh, there is a lot of interest in the thermal side, uh, whether from practitioners uh, deep into the thermal field or a lot of folks in uh, partner uh, technical working groups and spaces uh, who have a lot of interest. So we're very grateful for the contributions and we're looking forward to more uh, going forward. Uh, this is to remind us of the canonical problems that we've been looking at. Uh, there's the, we've used the same nomenclature that uh, Ravi has, Ravi and his technical working group has documented. So it's the 2D with stacked memory. There's the 3D stacked dies. There's uh, optics and uh, harsh environments, mobile applications. Uh, voltage regulators, I think uh, Kanad uh, touched on this. And uh, there's specific uh, use cases like 3D stack die cooling, which, which we actually heard about a lot in yesterday's keynotes from uh, Subhashish and uh, Ken Goodson from Stanford in two separate keynotes. This is a new chart. Uh, uh, submitted by Ravi and uh, Wehua from Intel. I'm very thankful. This uh, power density chart was, I think, presented at a workshop, a HIR workshop two years ago uh, by an Intel VP, and it's been uh, refurbished for publication as part of our 2020 chapter. And as you can see, uh, there is some pretty dramatic watts per millimeter square power densities. So watts per millimeter square, uh, you can see uh, three watts per millimeter square is the same as uh, 300 watts per centimeter square. So just to give you, if you're used to uh, hundreds of watts per centimeter square, um, you can multiply by 100 and that, that'll give you that conversion. 
Uh, a key item here that, that's been uh, highlighted is the difference between average power density and hotspots. And that is going to be a very key aspect of uh, meeting the thermal technology uh, requirements going forward, because you do have hotspots at different length scales and different time scales. And that's what this is showing. Another inclusion, I think this uh, was a suggestion by Ravi a few months ago to explicitly include HPMs. I think this is a very happening field, so it isn't very easy to bring in a lot of detail about what is absolutely current. Uh, but going forward, we have to think about how to characterize these uh, stack die memory challenges in a quantitative way. Uh, this is a snapshot of the advanced uh, technologies and research. Uh, it's being refurbished. Uh, Gamal and team have made a, Gamal uh, Bagat and team have uh, refactored the section on uh, system cooling and thermal interfaces. So we will be including that as we go through the reviews with some editing to combine it with what we already have. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a partnership uh, between some folks in industry and SEMI on uh, looking into a pre-competitive silicon microchannel study. I want to emphasize the pre-competitive piece and the fact that the study is being made available to HIR and the community uh, as an offering uh, if we choose to absorb it and learn from it. Obviously, this field has been studied for four decades in academia and at the lab level, uh, but the interest here is to leverage SEMI's uh, supply chain objectivity to bring some further understanding of scale manufacturing uh, in the context of actually trying to mess with the silicon. And that's something we've stayed away from, uh, but you know, inspired by Nikki Lu's uh, presentation yesterday, if we want to bend that heterogeneous integration curve up into the trillion dollar range, um, I think we are gonna have to do something radical in the next five to 10 years, uh, as, as hard as it might be. That's, that's my opinion, but I think it's, it's worth uh, including in the uh, HIR roadmap as one of the areas for emphasis. Uh, this is just a snapshot of what's been done. On the right-hand side is an artifact from DARPA's iSchool program, where tens of millions of university and academic and lab funding has resulted in some extremely fine uh, studies. And I think trying to make sense of whether that, those studies and those incredibly high cooling capabilities can be translated into uh, devices that we, this industry will be manufacturing in the next five to 10 years uh, would be a very interesting exercise. Uh, with that, this is my last slide. Uh, uh, we expect to kick off uh, weekly and bi-weekly syncs and uh, hope to refactor and reshape uh, this space with a lot of input from the uh, cross-twig uh, feedback. So. Uh uh, Amrit's Integrated Photonics. Okay, so my name is Amr Helmi, and I am with the University of Toronto, and I serve as the co-chair for uh, the um, Photonics Twig. And what I'd like to talk to you today about is some of the updates and the um, refocusing of the Photonic Twig critical path items. So um, the key challenges for photonics and systems in a, pa in a package have not been changed. And this year I've actually tried to divide them into two columns. One is the one on the right hand side is deemed some of the existing more standard challenges that exist for packaging uh, devices of heterogeneous nature in a chip generally, stress, CTE, power delivery, lifetime, etc. But there are some more pressing issues right now given the nature of uh, what is going on um, with respect to silicon uh, system in a package. So the thermal load of each component, the temperature stability requirements for photonics are very different than those of um, electronics. And that tends to actually skew the design of the photonics themselves uh, to make them work. And that affects things like power. So very tightly interconnected network of power consumption, space, as well as uh, temperature stability. So what I uh, 
sorry about that. So what a, a cost of a single fiber mode um, attached as well is one of the least appealing, if you like, topics, but slightly, uh, actually, did, it's quite detrimental for some of the uh, companies that are doing these. And we really need, as, as, as less appealing as that may be, we really need to try to strike either, either a consortium or a work group to try to tackle that once and for all, because this is a problem that has been conventionally tackled in the uh, in academia, less so um, in, in, in industry. And that's why the solutions tend to be somewhat fancier speaking less about yield, more about, um, more about uh, design. Uh, so just to remind you and to update the slide, this is the most recent set of data that goes up to 2020, where the IO bandwidth density continues to play a limiting role for exponentially or for any increase whatsoever for the computing uh, capabilities. And this density is limited to a large degree by um, sort of power and, and thermal issues. So you need a lot of power to get, um, as, you, as you're well aware, to get um, carriers from A to B across the chip itself, across the multi-chip module itself, but at the same time, uh, optics can come there to the rescue, but it hasn't done so. And that's one of the reasons why we would like to discuss that in a, in a bit more details, because there's, as you can see, a pressing need that clearly there is a ceiling where electronics is not able to do more if we would like to maintain uh, the, the power density in the chip uh, and the counts to go up. So, so some of the examples where this could actually bring us uh, to, to, to bring us up with some optimism is the work from Cerebrus recently, where they have uh, collaborated with um, TSMC and they've had a chip scale uh, engine, if you will, where the interconnections themselves within the chip itself are very close, but not quite exactly the same bandwidth as those between the chiplets, because that was done monolithically. So, so that tends to increase the uh, computing capability that tends to reduce the bottleneck, but at, at the expense of the power consumption and the electrical uh, bandwidth. So the question that I pose to you, given the success that Cerebrus has been having in building these chip scale or rather wafer scale engines, one of the things that we would like to try to strike as a, as a working group or, or a task force is, could one achieve something like that optically, where there is a bit of a flip chip uh, at the interfaces to get this done optically? That would certainly have a, provide an inflection point. Why? Because that inflection point will mean that the interconnection between these chiplets now will no longer be the same bandwidth uh, between uh, uh, within uh, as the same bandwidth uh, within the chiplet, but even higher. So that can provide some capabilities of a network on a chip that is not possibly available now. So this is one of the um, possibilities uh, that uh, that we try to discuss and respect in the in the chapter. But just to give you a feel for why the design of the optical devices is very, is very much tied to the hip to 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 the system budget is, is looking at some of the thermal budgets. Uh, some of the very early on be between Berkeley and MIT that, that had zero change photonic components uh, be built on silicon provided great capabilities, but relatively modest bandwidth and relatively high power consumption. Uh, but at the same time, if you try to mitigate that by trying to have the power consumption itself reduced, you'd make these modulators, the optical modulators shown in this top center here, you'd make them even more resonant. And in that case, you'd make them more power dependent, uh, sorry, more um, temperature dependent. So there is an interplay between power and thermal here that is difficult to overcome using conventional approaches that has been utilized thus far in photonics. So uh, the minute you use a, a resonator, like the ring resonator here, you will reduce the power because of the resonance that you see on the top uh, right-hand side and the slide, but you will also uh, make it significantly more temperature sensitive. And that's not the operating temperature, this is the temperature swing and stability. And these are two separate things, as we've discussed in the thermal chapter. So the, the issue here is that Photonics has the two sensitivities, the swing in temperature and also the operating temperature. Some devices such as, for example, the lasers that I show you on the left-hand side here are extremely sensitive to temperature as shown for conventional quantum wall lasers on the top left plot. But incredible, incredible advance have been recently done with quantum dots in silicon where one can actually build a different type of active material where the laser action takes place. And this active material looks like a quasi 
uh, sort of a, a zero dimensional material, dots basically like artificial atoms. And in doing so, one can significantly reduce the laser operating temperature dependence as shown in the second plot on the right hand side. So you can tell that the pump laser itself could be made significantly less temperature dependence. But still, if we would like to expand the bandwidth, this is not gonna work because this is one laser. So you're gonna have to put, if you would like to have 10 channels, you're gonna need to put 10 lasers. And recently some substantial advances have been done uh, between um, Berkeley and Caltech. Uh, and it was highlighted yesterday by Golden uh, Keeler's, um, in Golden Keeler's presentation where some of these quantum dot lasers, which we know and love, are extremely temperature insensitive. They've been coupled into nonlinear resonators where one can tailor uh, the gain, the nonlinear gain and the propagation to provide a different kind of coherent source called the comb source. And the advantage of this comb source, in this case, heterogeneously integrated to look in a butterfly mount, like, look, like the center bottom there, that's the size of, a, of effectively a um, a coin on a thermoelectric cooler can provide you with approximately uh, maybe a hundred lines of laser radiation that you can use for multiple channels, all self-pulsed. And this could provide very valuable clocking um, uh, capabilities because of the level of um, purity of uh, and the phase and the reduction in the phase noise approach. So on the front of the sources, the power supplies that have always been bogging down photonics to infiltrate into um, into interconnects, there's been incredible advances in the last 48 months. Um, moving forward beyond that, what can else can we do? As I mentioned to you, there are some fundamental limitations associated with the fact that in a silicon waveguide or in a silicon set of structures, interference is the way by which we can get things guided, can get things working. But in an alternative route uh, that has been gaining uh, traction, uh, you could, you don't have to use that. You can use metal optics. And also another inflection point in my view that was published recently in IADM, IADM and six months ago, then there are now plasmonic transceivers, filter, a, a receiver and a transmitter that have now been able to outperform. This is my last, my last slide. Uh, they are able to outperform uh, silicon photonics uh, by way of every single metric. And most importantly, the ceiling where silicon photonics cannot break is the latency. And right now these show latency of approximately less than 10 nanoseconds when the best that can happen in silicon is between 50 and 100. So the future is extremely bright for photonics. And in um, brief conclusion, as we always say that photonics continues and remains to be a key enabler. At this point in time, many of the roadblocks that prevent or postpone its deployment to replace um, Electronic copper wires uh, is are being decimated basically and dissolving very quickly. Our next presentation will be Ken Lanier speaking for uh, the test, uh, the test wig. Um, so, what does the test group do? Um, we have a large number of people who are uh, basically drawn from the uh, equipment and uh, IC manufacturing worlds. Uh, you can look at the list of topics that we tend to track here. Uh, this list will morph depending on how the needs change, but the test twig is a little bit different from all the other twigs. The other twigs sort of focus on what it's possible to build. Um, and from that, we get sort of a list of things that need to be tested. Um, but what we're sort of focused on is what is it possible to man practically manufacture and test? And uh, to that end, uh, the service we'd like to provide back to the other twigs is, well, what would make what you're doing easier to test? So uh, a quick update of the 2021 uh, uh, chapter and what we're working on. The production requirements, uh, a lot of them require sort of continue on the same vectors they have historically. Uh, you know, logic devices are getting bigger, so scan test times get larger, scan and functional test. Uh, CERTES rates keep going up, as, uh, uh, as everyone understands. The RF devices in production were at 70 gigahertz because of 5G, and that'll just go up. Photonics continues to be a challenge um, uh, in terms of a, a practical test interface solution. And what's new is we're now spending a lot more time on data analytics. Uh, we believe they're going to become... Uh, a key to more efficient manufacturing and uh, also uh, a higher yield. And yield is what primarily uh, drives the economics of what we're all doing. 
uh, higher, you know, the economics of everything we do is pretty much driven by not having to scrap good device, um, having to scrap parts uh, unnecessarily or even worse assemblies. Uh, so all the things that I said are true, uh, reg regardless of whether they're monolithic die system and packages, the die are big or small, all of these trends continue to apply. Um, so what I'd like to do is focus the rest of the uh, time I have on uh, things that are unique to the HIR world. Uh, so the packaging keeps making things more interesting, smaller pitches, heat dissipation, as we just heard. Um, but on the inside, um, what makes everything economical to produce? So if you look at uh, sort of how packaging changes what we do, the, uh, if you look at a monolithic uh, device that's a heterogeneous device, has a lot of different functions on it, uh, test is usually defined at the outside of that device and sort of how things move around inside the device is a function of the monolithic design. And as we go to a heterogeneous package case, clearly the manufacturing process gets a lot more complicated but the test is still uh, defined at a monolithic level. So we know how to test each of the individual things that go on the, uh, in the package, on the substrate, whatever it is. Uh, and what we'd like to do is going forward, think a little bit more about this package level test access. And um, the, uh, if you think about it a little bit, you know, if, you, if you're looking at testing this sort of thing, um, you know, the, the, the strategy that seems to work best in terms of testing and getting good results is to test the individual silicon very, very well, make sure you have known good dye um, or as well known good as possible, and then have a very, very good assembly process. Uh, and then you sort of test it all when it's done. So the, the analogy uh, in this case for manufacturing, it's, it's kind of like a, um, a space capsule re-entering the atmosphere, right? The first thing you do is you test every piece of the system that you can individually. Um, you launch the build, in this case, fire the retro rockets. Um, you go into a communications blackout, in which case you lose, in our, our case, observability inside the thing that you're building to a large extent. Um, you know, what's going on between all the different pieces of silicon. And then from a manufacturing point of view, what you do at the end, you know, you sort of get the system level test results, you know, the rocket analogy is you would look at the sky and hope that, you know, the capsule comes out in one piece. And this is sort of a problem that we'd like to solve. We'd like to not, you know, be standing on the ground looking at the sky, hoping our assembly process was good and that we're actually gonna get in a, you know, a multi-die assembly that actually works. So one of the things that we'd like to work on uh, is how you uh, address that problem. And the thing is, it's, it, this is, you know, it's not a new problem necessarily. You know, if you look at the problem that we have with uh, multi-die packages, um, you know, it's, it, you could go back and look at any PC board and you kind of see the same problem, right? You have uh, a lot of heterogeneous stuff going on. You have, uh, you certainly can't probe a lot of things going on on the, um, on the PC board and you're reliant on test structures within the board to guarantee that uh, you can somehow test the assembly. Some, it may be an electrical test, uh, an x-ray test, whatever it is. And then at the end, what you do is you plug it into whatever system it goes into and see if it works. And so I think a lot of the solution space that we would leverage to sort of uh, solve our uh, multi-die problem, um, you know, a lot of the, the solutions can be leveraged from what's been developed to develop the other heterogeneous integration roadmap that happens to, you know, manifest itself in a, in a PC board. Um, so again, you know, we talk a lot about, and all the other twigs will talk about, well, you know, what can we make the little individual pieces do? Uh, we would like to think of it as more of a system when we're done and have a testability strategy for the whole, whole system when it's done. Um, and so that's where we think we can contribute to the rest of the groups in terms of, you know, this is what it can do. We can talk about, well, here's how you would test it. So what do we really need? Uh, we need a, a mostly heterogeneous integration roadmap. And, and what do I mean by that? Um, you know, we need to be able to test each of the components on its own. So if we have a piece of silicon that we're working on, uh, you know, the first thing we want to think about is, well, if I had to build a million of these, how would I test it efficiently 
with equipment that's actually buildable. So, you know, things like weak IOs or, or you know, TSVs we need to probe, things like that. Those are all things that make it very difficult, even though it's um, part of the uh, enablers that make this stuff work, it makes it very, very difficult to manufacture and test. Um, you know, fault coverage uh, is, is good. I know we, we have some a simulation twig. Um, everything in the system, it's really helpful if it talks the same DFT language. So there's a JTAG standard for um, heterogeneous ICs, right? That allow you to go from one core to the next. There's logic that surrounds it to allow it to be testable. So if we think about each individual piece, how would you test it and how would you get access to those test functions from outside the system becomes really, really key. And a lot of systems that we're building uh, require self-test, things like that. Same Less problem. Less than a minute, Ken. Got it, the last slide. Um, so there must be observability inside what we're building. Uh, there must be a common way to collect data for every single piece of the system, each die in the final assembly to have traceability. Uh, but the message is really simple. If, if heterogeneous devices uh, in multi-die packages are gonna be successful, it has to be as manufacturer and testable as a single piece of silicon. You know, silicon technology is our competitor, right? Um, you know, we think we can do more than uh, a single piece of silicon. And in order to be able to do that, uh, whatever we build has to be as testable as the thing we're competing against. Uh, the final one in group one, the final presentation is uh, cybersecurity. Sarab, are you on? Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, yes, I, I, uh... I'm going to talk about the uh, cybersecurity tweak. And uh, here you see the list of our members on the screen. Uh, I'm uh, Sohrab Afabjahani from Intel. I, the chair and the, the previous chair was a Scott List. And uh, we have also a Jewel RB, uh, RB and uh, Ariton uh, uh, Hopoff uh, from Arm and the Texas Instrument. Uh, and I go over a couple of uh, uh, general uh, uh, cybersecurity, hardware changes and needs, and then uh, about the specifics of heterogeneous integration roadmap needs. Um, the, then I have some specific uh, heterogeneous integration security opportunities, and there are some conclusions. Uh, Yes, uh, as uh, as you guys know that uh, uh, security uh, is more like uh, uh, horizontal, uh, and uh, with, with the is, is a horizontal uh, property of of the system uh, that uh, then it, it interacts with uh, all the aspects of the system that we have. And uh, here we have listed some form of attacks. I'm just going over these uh, as a review uh, and, uh, and what are the impacts and how they should be mitigated. Then all together, if we want to have a secure system, we should look at what are the attack vectors and how they can um, impact security and what are the ways that we can uh, actually uh, mitigate those. And uh, and we actually we looked at the interface leakage, the supply chain attacks, side channel attacks, uh, chip counterfeiting, uh, physical tampering, fault injection attacks, and reverse engineering attacks. And as you guys see that uh, there are uh, different Im impacts uh, based on the different type of attacks that we have, for example, uh, for the uh, with respect to uh, supply chain attacks, we can have uh, some form of uh, hidden or delayed or unwanted functionality uh, in the uh, system that can cause uh, confidentiality, integrity, or availability compromise. And uh, examples of these are like Trojans. And uh, uh, we, we had we had some discussions about uh, supply chain security uh, with uh, some other tweaks and uh, to. Uh, and, and with respect to the mitigation strategy, we can have better form of validation and uh, testing, and also some form of parasitic extraction, as we can, uh, also some active triggering mechanisms uh, can be uh, useful to detect these issues. And also we should uh, 
make sure that we have IP design materials uh, provenance. Uh, uh, sorry, how, how much more do I have? Three and a half minutes. Okay, then uh, you, you have this table. I do not go over the details. You guys can take a look at this. Yeah, and and as I mentioned, uh, with its security, it has interactions with many other areas. And, uh, and actually we had a couple of meetings with uh, aerospace and defense uh, twigs and uh, getting their feedback and uh, they were concerned about supply chain attacks. Uh, and uh, also uh, we had uh, some other uh, communication from uh, some of the other twigs. If you guys have any, uh, anything special that needs uh, uh, our attention, please feel free to reach out to me. And I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, arrange some more meetings with the rest of the uh, twigs to make sure that we will have uh, better coverage for all the other areas. Uh, then, uh, and I just, I just uh, show you guys a couple of things that. Uh, that's uh, that I think is important, and uh, like uh, with respect to the uh, information flow security, uh, if if you guys see that uh, like for the heterogeneous integration systems, we have uh, like a couple of uh, uh, chips or chiplets. They are somehow connected to each other, uh, and whether they are on uh, two-dimensional uh, or three-dimensional, the left one on, on the right-hand one, uh, and uh, we just look at the logic, how they are connected. Uh, and uh, then uh, some of the things important is uh, like we need uh, signal integrity requirements. And uh, then with some form of uh, cryptographic methods like hash-based message authentication, we can actually take care of these also for some signals that we uh, that need both uh, integrity and confidentiality requirements. Uh, then uh, we can use authenticated uh, encryption uh, protocols, and uh, all of these add some circuitry to the to the system. Especially uh, if you think about chiplets, uh, when you have the communication uh, between the, the chiplets, uh, you may have some uh, metal lines accessible, uh, and uh, then if we can uh, encrypt the data, uh, we can actually avoid the. Uh, uh, Get, avoid having the data observed. And, uh, and also uh, with respect to packaging, there are some specific may ways that we can uh, improve the security by like using anti-tampering sensors in the systems, uh, or, uh, or maybe we can use uh, active and passive shields uh, to, erode, to avoid probing attacks. Uh, also, uh, it's possible to uh, actually uh, use uh, uh, some of the package in such a way that uh, the actual interconnects goes to the package and if you just break the uh, design uh, sorry break the package then you just uh, make the make the system uh, or chip here uh, unusable and uh, there are also some specific ways that we can uh, take care of security by having like a security controller these are more or less like what we do in testing we can have a, like, some form of controller that uh, uh, it's, here it's a, like a central controller. Uh, it, it could be like any form of distributed system. And uh, then at, actually it will uh, look at uh, each of the chips uh, here. Here we have uh, just, we are showing two dies. And if uh, there are any, uh, we, we check if, uh, if uh, we, we, we attest those, we make sure that they are, they are, they are authentic. And then based on that, we can, actually uh, 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 create the uh, communication between those. Otherwise, uh, we will see that something is wrong and the security controller flag it and stop the communication. Uh, also, uh, we can have uh, uh, some uh, uh, the other mechanism to actually power some of the elements off, uh, or we can uh, have some form of uh, uh, monitoring for like energy clock and EM if to, if if you are suspicious about uh, some abnormal activities like trojans or something, uh, and also the other the, the last thing is we can actually uh, the, assign the uh, configuration of the, of the chips dynamically. In, in this way, we can ha have some form of isolation or make some changes. Uh, and with respect to the three uh, D. 
just about out of time. Okay, just just a just a minute. Do I can I have? A... Yeah, go ahead. Yes, and uh, also with respect to the uh, like uh, 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 3D. Uh, uh, um, sorry, with respect to the, uh, the three, uh, split manufacturing, uh, uh, we can we can have some specific elements that uh, can help us to actually to rewrote the uh, the connections and and if we can program these like with some specific keys, then we can make the, these very difficult to uh, determine uh, how how they how one of the elements from one layer have been connected to the other layers. And if the, if the keys are not present uh, or the, the right keys are not used, uh, we can avoid these. And, and with, with all of these the things that I showed you guys, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of work going on. And also the, the last thing that I have here is like for EM side channel attacks. And uh, then also we need some uh, form of the EDA tools to be able to uh, help us do some advanced analysis, uh, especially uh, uh, with heterogeneous integrated systems, uh, because we have a better uh, ap uh, uh, approximity uh, uh, and, and closer approximity among the components, uh, then side channel attacks are much more important. This is actually the work from um, Dr. Ma Michael Orshansky from University of Texas, and that's in the paper. And, and anyways, I just uh, close this, that uh, we need the collaboration with all other uh, twigs uh, to be able to actually uh, mitigate some of the uh, threats. And uh, otherwise we can have just some uh, marginal benefits. Then the best way is to have like system level uh, approach to mitigate all the threats. And uh, that's uh, all uh, from uh, my side. And, and we are going to have a major update uh, with respect to the chip chiplet uh, for 2021. That's uh, my plan. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the, the presenters in this session. Uh, yep. OK, I think the, uh, um, um, Bill, I think the questions uh, should be addressed, should be have all the six different um, tricks and uh, see whether they have questions for each other. And uh, then we can also invite the uh, rest of the uh, tricks to come along. Rest of the people, whoever they are, whether you are a member or not, uh, questions would be good and welcome. Well, why don't we follow the, the approach of uh addressing each one of the twigs that presented and uh, let everyone else have a chance to question them as Bill Chen suggested. Um, so let's let's start off with uh, the, the first presentation was uh, high performance computing and data centers with Kanad. And uh, anyone who has a question for Kanad, uh, either a part of this group or are, are otherwise, but let's start with the presenters from the other technical working groups in, in group one. Um, the floor is yours. Any questions? Uh, my question to Kanad is, how do you view bringing in quantum computing? It's, it seems physically a different species. Uh, it, I, I don't know if it is. Uh, I need to go read your chapter much more in detail. But uh, how are you, what is your vision to bring that into our roadmap? Uh, because it looks so different, um, just curious. Okay, so uh, Madhu, the short answer is, there are components in the quantum computing system that can be integrated. Uh, so if you look at the bulk of the quantum computing systems that use 20 milli Kelvin of cooling and whatnot, there are new advances that have been made with qubit implementations and with the control plan, which is basically the circuitry that sets the state of the qubit, does the measurement on the qubit state, sets up the qubit interaction and whatnot. So at least in the world of solid state qubits, like the one that Intel is pursuing, they have developed uh, qubit controllers that can also be integrated with the quantum plane. The quantum plane contains the qubits, 
the interconnections, perhaps most of the quantum logic get and whatnot. So that can be done, both can be cooled simultaneously. So there are ways to do that. In the world of photonic qubits, uh, like the ones that are pursued by Zanadu and others, where you don't need to cool down the quantum plane and things can operate at room temperatures, there's certainly similar possibilities of at least integrating the quantum plane and the data plane. If you look at the uh, semi uh, super uh, cool qubits uh, from your company, from a large uh, set of uh, you know established companies in the base, the integration challenges are more difficult. You do not want any heat source, uh, such as the control plane, close to the qubits. So that that that's a challenge you have to address and. Because of the lack of, you know, documentation on the qubit controllers and the control plane, this is very difficult to quantify. So what we have we have done in our chapter is to lay out the integration possibilities and where they apply. Uh, we are going to put out our chapter in the next uh, seven or ten days. We are collecting inputs, uh, comments, and whatnot. But I can send you a copy of the draft version that we have, with the caveat that if not the final final version. Can I supplement yeah. that, please, uh, when you have a minute, uh, Kanat? Yes, please. Uh, sure, this is Amr. Madhu, the, the, the qubits themselves, the superconducting ones, don't come in one flavor. They come in different flavors, but they share a common L temperature of operation that is, in, that is much lower than you being able to keep everything else at that same temperature. So as I'm sure you're well aware, there is a tiered cryostat where different components sit at different uh, uh, parts of the cryo at different temperatures. But recently, that's not the only qubit out there. There is a class of qubits called semiconductor qubits right now that could be built and have been built on FD FDSOI that from 22 nanometer generations and down, they can actually operate at a few Kelvins. So, so there is an entire, so it's important when we put in, in the, I mean, it's important when we take these into account in our roadmap, not that that we take into account all the upcoming things, not not just the not just one generation. So there are ones that are being developed and have been demonstrated that tackle the problem that Madhu is speaking about. That how can you keep the entire system on a micro Kelvin? There are so, ones. Uh, uh, Amir, let me interject. These are all covered in our chapters, current okay. and you know emerging ones in quite a bit of detail, and you know Madhu will have a look at the chapter and the yeah the my that drives the integration is the need for a significant amount of connections between the control plane and the quantum plane. And that's where heterogeneous integration can help provided one can develop low power control plane that can be co-cooled with the high temperature qubit, slightly high temperature, which is, you know, 100 millikelvin to a few de degrees Kelvin. Yeah, my, my question wasn't cooling. I was just curious about uh, you know it's a transitional more revolutionary technology it's about how the roadmap approaches something that looks very different so it was more generic to the roadmap not cool right, right. i hope i answered uh, the question you know you did you did yeah thank you thank you so any, any other questions that you have for the hpc and this is enough? Yeah, Kanad, this is Ravi. The, I, you know, I, I have been thinking about the intent of the HIR roadmap was to project a problem statement that the future will, you know, like we will get everybody interested and say, I, I need to focus on this particular area. Uh, John Shelf showed one principle of, of how computing will evolve. And there have been others who are saying stuff like this. Could we somehow manage to synthesize the output of your workshop and say, here is where we absolutely must in, invest for success. And by invest, I mean intellectual investment as well as eventually financial investment so that the research is focused right. Like what are your thoughts on how to do this? Uh, uh, right, right, Ravi. So, you know, the focus should be on uh, increasing the density of the connections or the, you know, escape bandwidth at the age of the chiplet. That certainly is a focus area that affects HPC, you know, integration of power sources uh, to help uh, the uh, chiplets to come together is another, but you know, quantum imposes a new twist. Photonics for IO is another. So, so what you're saying is, you know, it's spread out in our chapter 
uh, I take your suggestion is to have a single section where you can delineate the needs instead of going over the 40 plus pages that you have in the 20 edition. Yes, so you will do that and we will need help from a lot of the other twigs, photonics, uh, the 2D, 3D and whatnot. But part of the interconnection challenge that we see emerging is the need to provide coherence to implement the system view of uh, aggregated uh, memory, aggregated computing and whatnot that John Schultz spread out, which is basically what follows from the OCP, the Open Compute Platform specs, you know, it's a generalization of that. And a lot of that depends on what you're uh, trying to integrate and what you're trying to, you know, disaggregate. So that that's something that we have to look at. And there are implications on the interconnections chapter as well. What is the range of the coherence that you provide? Is it just confined to the SIP or does it have to go beyond? And that, that, that's, that's a discussion we need to have within a number of three chapters. Yeah, no, I believe it has to go beyond and you know the- Yes, it has to go beyond, yeah. obviously. Right. I think we, ought, we should not confuse advanced development with true research kind of things. Because, right, right, uh, right. So, and then I have a question here. In uh, last uh, chapters, we had a gap uh, between, for example, uh, HPC and, for example, Axermel like about what kind of power you expected. Uh, I know, like this uh, round uh, bucket was giving you something. Uh, and could be still, we have a gap uh, because could be you're already seeing, uh, in order to accomplish the performance target, you need to have a certain level of power which could be uh, the uh, case. If this is the case, can we try to see from the thermal chapter here, if there is a gap here, we identify it under say, a performance need and thermal roadmap maybe is, not, is a little bit behind and you try to have it rather than we keep the discrepancy without explanation? So, so Gamal, the answer <clears> to your <throat> question is not straightforward. A lot depends on what is inside the SIP. There could be different challenges for your world in the FPGA world versus what is happening in some of the machine learning world. What we have done in the 2019 chapter is to delineate the TDPs at the package level. And you know the system architects that integrate the various components that come together in HPC data center SIP can respect those limits and design around that. But to delineate, you know, the, what I guess what we're getting at is, you know watts per centimeter squared. That again depends on the spectrum of solution. Uh, it also boils down to can we cool, uh, do spot cooling inside the chip and whatnot. So these are challenges we have uh, put out you know, qualitatively instead of quantitatively because it's very, very difficult to do. No, but should we put the other way around? Like uh, I, I visualize uh, this uh, my personal interpretation, your uh, twig, is more by comparison in a company, my silicon architecture uh, team, which is telling me this is what I need to have. And in this case, I believe the catch as a thermal chapter <clears throat> to say how I can do it for you. So in this case, you will be targeting performance and say this performance requires this kind of wattage. You guys, no, I need exactly, to have this. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to get there. Exactly, okay. You know, performance means many things, you know, it may mean inferences per <laughs> second in the machine learning world. I agree. Versus flops. And there is no common denominator in all of this because the technologies are different, the technology is emerging. We can spell out specific limits that we expect in different regimes and you know, put that out in our chapter. But we'd like to engage in a discussion with many of the key players. And uh, yeah, this will be something that we can do in the 2021 20, uh, edition. This would be a good thing between uh, Madhu uh, as a twig for Sermon Liu, uh, like a more closer one. This is my suggestion for 22 uh, activity, 23, if we can be able to. Uh, 2021. As one item. Yeah. Good for 2021. Okay. So uh, I had to hog the time unless there are some really burning questions that I can respond to. So going, going, gone. Next, next week chapter, I guess. Okay, we, we still have uh, time on the schedule for additional discussions and, and we'll open it up to a larger group. Are there any other questions from the other presenters, the other twigs? One, one that we haven't talked about yet and will come up later is uh, 
is the, in the materials twig is what properties of materials do we need and what what new materials can be done you know what uh, tell us what what properties have to be there and then we'll try to figure out ways to do it and it will go back and forth we can do it this way not that way but uh and i think we're going to have to iterate back and forth between the different twigs so that the expertise of all uh look at the problem since it really is a problem for us all. The best thermal control mechanism is not make the heat in the first place. Yeah, and Bill, I agree with you. The The issue is uh, we, not everybody looks at the word heat with the same language. If you talk to people like Gemal or Madhu, all of us talk about it in terms of watts per millimeter square or watts per centimeter square. And to us, it is either a transient spike or a steady state dissipating source. But if you talk to an architect, the way they look at things is, you know, if it spike happens and nobody sees it like a tree falls in the forest kind of deal, uh, they don't worry too much about it. And I, I I'm amazed that we don't speak the same language at all times. So uh, I don't know, Gemal or Madhu, if you guys have a comment on this subject, but I don't think we are even in the same space. So discussing materials to me sometimes becomes like talking completely at cross purposes. Yeah, I can comment. I think, I think Ravi, what you and Gamal and Kanad have been discussing is probably at the core of the roadmap and the mission. And what I mean is, architects architect solutions right they they as kanad was saying they take all the information and in everywhere and they make judgment calls and they construct a house or a machine with so many disciplines so they do need to prioritize or deprioritize uh, issues or trends across disciplines but those of us in the disciplines we are looking at problems across the place and we're looking in the over time, what are our challenges? So I actually, one of your comments in the chat, Ravi, resonate with me in how the roadmap is maybe constructed going forward is the comment you made about identifying needs for research or manufacturing or maybe it's architecture, but I think identifying needs that need to be solved or problems that need to be addressed in the next 10 years or five years, to me, that resonates as a way of looking at it. But I agree with you. If I'm an architect and I'm building something, for this, that two years, I might disregard a trend because I want to ship a product. Yep. Let me comment something also to add to um, do from different perspective. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we are uh, as a thermal at large, we say what per millimeter square or centimeter square, but your point is, is right. And there is a lot of activity about material, how response in short time transient, like the sparking here in macro millisecond is, uh, is really I will be able, uh, thermal sensing will not be able to have it, but we need to understand it is this will be leading to a performance issue? Is this leading to reliability issue? This is one will be getting more uh, uh, critical and the curve you already provided uh, to uh, Madhu is very interesting because you start seeing average power when you give it and after that you put another one which will localize one. Uh, it didn't show uh, how long the time can be having. Uh, this is one of the stuff here, uh, which we need to see how is, this will be impacting us from thermal chapters and going all of the way to materials, to performance, how we able to do that because currently we are steady state, quasi steady state are giving us a roadmap uh, for it. But it, it is like, I'm working on this one in, behind the door. I'm not sure how, how far we will be able to take it in a more publicly to start, uh, or the public uh, community ready to start disclosing something like that and start seeing to be part of the roadmap. I'm not sure, Madhu, yeah, sure. what do you think? Yeah, Gamal, at least the way I see the thermal roadmap, let me, since all of us are working, at least in industry, on confidential projects, our own applications, Kanad listed a bunch of them, and they all come up with architectures that are different because you have to build and ship a product in two years, three years. The way I see it is, 
we can surface challenging problems and physical issues. And then you put it out there and then the community, the research community, innovation community surfaces solutions. I think mapping the two very precisely is challenging because it comes down to architects and architecture and judgment calls around a product. That's my opinion. So I think addressing the problems and then addressing a whole host of solutions. I agree that we can do a better job of trying to connect the two, but I think there's a lot of challenges when you try to precisely connect the two, because at that point you're designing a product uh, which becomes very hard to do in a public domain. That's my opinion. What, what do you so, think? So, so Madhu, to add to that, there's also a lack of the kind of aggressive power management in heterogeneous integrated product uh, compared to what you see in CPUs and DRAMs. So that uh, philosophy of you know managing everything at a finer granularity in terms of power and performance trade-offs has to percolate throughout the SIP. And that requires standards for power management, obviously that we have not seen, that requires a global view of power. For us, power budgeting, we have listed these as possibilities, but uh, how much we can do in the short term and the near term and in the longer term, that is something that is difficult to again spell out given the diverse nature of the products that we have. It comes down to the point that you mentioned you know, in, in the real world. Yeah, I think if you're, if, you're rushing, yes. if you're rushing ahead with the technology to be for time to market, you make compromises on things like you yeah. said, and then if you hit a wall, then you might spend a huge amount of effort on this other thing that maybe has been neglected for two to five years. So that, that is how you do things when you're actually trying to ship a product, right? Uh, maybe I wanna hear back from Gamal and Ravi just to close the loop on your thoughts in this, on, on this discussion. I think your point is well taken, at least from my end, uh, as a product. Yeah, for sure, we have some restriction about the product, etc. Uh, but I, th we, we need to come to the point. I think uh, in like uh, because we are going to uh, three and two nanometers, and a lot of discussion. We know that the power is getting uh, very high. It's so localized one, which uh, in uh, micro uh, millimeters level and millisecond level uh, be having or microsecond level, how this impact, it is a known area for us as a thermal. I cannot put thermal sensor to uh, have it. We don't know if this will be a challenge from uh, reliability and material and stress. Currently, you are taking, for example, say our crack in uh, low-K RDL, look to the uh, macro bump and see what happened here. But now we are coming now to a point of failure. Uh, potentially, you are going to that one. Uh, we need to start putting something, in, I will say, in, in a roadmap to, to start alerting this one and uh, uh, have the people thinking about it from material, from reliability team also. Because otherwise, in this case, whatever performance being put uh, from uh, like H, uh, high performance computing will not be able to address it. And it will be good also that uh, somehow uh, Canan can come with uh, his T, uh, group, a way how we can see transient performance and the scale for that. This may be a, before we bought a roadmap, I think, yeah, to, to, what is the skill we need to have to, to have like a, the right language? Yeah, I, you make a great point. So the way I internalize it is we would highlight in the thermal chapter that time dependent power spikes and cooling is an issue or needs to be studied. Uh, hot spots at these length scales you mentioned you know, microns, hundreds of microns, millimeter scale, centimeter scale has to be studied. The combination of the two needs to be studied. But to what I was saying, we put it out there and then we need to uh, use public literature, research, uh, intelligence and mind share to then surface what's out there in there. Probably mapping the two very precisely is, is going to be hard because that's going to depend on an application. You are right. Yeah. So if I can make a quick comment on that, you know, the as part of the IEEE PSI keep 
harping on the fact that we need to build better bridges with the circuits community in IDM, ISSCC, and CICC. This very well might be a good opportunity for us to come to common language. Or, and that will describe how serious the problem is and whether we have really uh, uh, internalized how important this problem is. Does, it, does that make sense or am I going off at, on a tangent? I, don't know, I, I think, think that's a great that, suggestion. Yeah. That that's makes perfect sense to me, you know, as an academician, you know. It has always been a case of never the twin shall meet. The thermal guys and the architects never talk to each other. Right. And the architect solution has been to use temperature sensors to throttle the clock down you take out some of the steam that you're putting out on the cooling fork. So this requires a holistic approach to designing SIPs that yeah, we I, never, I, ever followed, right? I, I think a great point. Yeah, I, Ravi, I agree with you. I think what, what happens in the real world is people self-limit based on their knowledge. So if I'm, a, if I'm an architect and I know there's a problem coming on thermals or power integrity or something else, I might self limit myself just so I can come up with a design that has a chance of shipping. So actually pushing that envelope aggressively uh, needs a lot of pulling and, and uh, scrutiny on why people are self-limiting. So yeah, your proposal sounds appealing to me. Yeah. yeah. But, but then, you know, I have a comment, then why just stop at Thermal and performance, you know, you have to also address some of the other issues. We should. We yeah, yeah. Tractability, mm -hmm. testability, yeah. you know, power distribution, right? The thermal is visible. That's why we bring this up. But uh, I agree with you. The All of those. I mean, in testability, also self-repair, for instance, could be a way to exactly. uh, bypass problems. So. Thermal is the same like a fever, which you have any any disease will have a fever. So this is why <laughs> this is why in. <laughs> no, but it's guys, if you... Cover. But no, but no, no. If I, you know, I'm actually. If you look at power delivery, for instance, they deal with transients at a much, much intensive okay. level, and it never comes up. Uh, so th there, there must be something wrong in the way we communicate business, uh, in this business. So, Bill Bottoms, uh, do you want to uh, invite? Uh, yes, would sorry, you want so, to invite the larger group to participate in the discussion? So, Ravi, can I say a few words? Yes. Actually, they. they yep. Yeah, so uh, I think, you know, you bring up this point about transients, right? And so we've been looking at this from the perspective of a wafer scale system, a heterogeneous wafer scale system. Uh, and here's the issues, right? Basically, when workloads change regionally, right, on a wafer scale system, for example, and I think this is valid for any system, okay, you basically are drawing huge amounts of power okay, very, lo very locally, and obviously you will be dissipating huge amounts of power very locally. The time constant for that is of the order of a few nanoseconds, okay? So there is physically no thermal way, no thermal time constant that can match that. And one must just sort of, and if you can't deal with it, what do you do? You just say, okay, will hopefully it, it, it dissipates itself and spreads around within the chip and we're done, right? So I don't think there's, uh, there is, a, we're trying to, people are trying, architects are trying to ignore the problem. It's just that there's this, you know, packaging has always been, got this problem of disparate uh, uh, scales, right? And the thermal time scale and the electronic time scale are terribly different. No, I, for Zubo, I fully agree. In fact, it goes back to two points that one Gemal made, which is we have to look at reliability as well as thermal. I was just pointing out that thermals is a visible thing, but others like power delivery, et cetera, also deal with the same thing. So does reliability and others. So I fully agree with you that some of these, you know, the time, thermal time constant for response is so much higher than some of these problems that we may not have as big a impact in thermals versus other yeah, things. And, and Ravi, you know, we are very lucky that silicon is a darn good conductor. It's an okay conductor. <laughs> it's, it's, only, it's only one third. More yeah, one third of copper and one yeah, fourth of silver is not good, that good. Right? Yeah, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you are taking a sub micron, so you are going from 110 <laughs> to 60 now. No, but uh, uh, for your point is very good, uh, uh, Suba, about uh, timing. Yes, we will not be able to see in uh, nanosecond or microsecond, 
what I'm, uh, I see now, I know time zero. For example, I start, I know time zero. I know that I can be able to know at, uh, if I do very good digitaling and I have a very good TCV, I can know in millisecond. So in this case, I can see what happened between time zero and millisecond. And in this case, I'm telling you, you are in transient conduction uh, for, for this one, which in this case, uh, a uh, short uh, time transient will be able to understand what happened in nanosecond, but we need to mix. No, and this no, is the I reason mean, we go to yeah. the reliability and also current and all of this need to be well understood. We have uh, only a short time left before our discussion period is over for this particular session. So I have a, a quick questions. I'd like to ask the trick to comment on the vision from uh, Professor Mitra uh, yesterday that the work done at Stanford and MIT that require new materials, new architectures, thermal, mechanical, everything. That is a future that he described. So how can we look at that and think about the research area that we need to engage? Thank you. It's primarily changing from silicon to, to uh, uh, carbon structures instead of silicon structures. And uh, the whole issues are different. The, the yeah. connectivity is so much higher uh, for thermal as, as well as for electrical on a per unit basis. Um, there, there are different so reliability have, issues, right? Carbon nanotube transistors are known to be very prone to failure, you know? manufacturing issues, defects, uh, operation time in the field. I am to read, yet to read the paper that he suggested where it discusses the reliability. That's a big challenge. For specialized platforms, yes, that's a great architecture, but to convert it to a general purpose substrate, you know, have intermediate cooling layers with micro channels, you know, how much of that can be done practically remains to be seen. But I, I, I would suggest something here. We are a recipient of the, ser, uh, of the silicon, which is based on business model infrastructure, which fabulous. Our roadmap is not changing the infrastructure fabulous. If the circuit, like a roadmap of circuit, and this is changing the silicon architecture, and you are moving in that direction, and you already define it, and the business model moving in that direction, we, our roadmap will be coming in the second level to do it. But in order that as a roadmap for uh, uh, packaging it, integration, and I start to dictate what is the future of silicon architecture, uh, of the device circuit architecture, <clears throat> I shouldn't, I, I think that we are, it is not in the mandate of this roadmap. We should be, take a step back again from that. And if it is adopted and business model adopted, in this case, we will try to see how we are, the roadmap will be working this. I will not put restriction like what you just said. What you just said may be good for, for three, four, five years. If we are looking at 15 years and your materials, we are looking at 25 years. So that is a, a long, long view that we are looking at. I understand, but you need to have the other one in the front of uh, us, like yeah. circuit people, yeah. other community accepted. We have graphene being bought before in Georgia Tech, I bought other wow. architecture, I we change, and we didn't, didn't happen. So I'm not going to argue with you on that. I'm just but, saying is that I like to invite our community to look at future in a long view and not just be restricted to what we have today. That, our, our responsibility is to look at a long view. What we have today is, is uh, not the purpose, it's the starting place. And we, we need to project out 15 or more years and provide what's going to be needed at that time. And we are now in our, in our break period. We've got a five minute break. So okay, yeah, that's yeah, an intermediate solution where a stack like that built on carbon nanotube transistors is part of a bigger chip that uses conventional silicon. The, so the, the reason why we have the speaker yesterday is to invite all of them to give us a vision. So we have some very interesting people from yesterday. So, okay, thank you. We have a break. <laughs>